My name is Carrie Robinson. I am a, an extremely grateful alumna of Yale Divinity School. And I want to thank Jim and Karen and your extraordinary colleagues for putting together this unique and deeply meaningful convening and for so graciously giving me the privilege of introducing our final keynote. My gratitude in part stems from the fact that I met Henry Nowen for the first time in this very room more than 23 years ago. I was introduced to him by my teacher, advisor, and spiritual director, Margaret Farley. That meeting changed my life. Years later, I would have a similar unforgettable experience upon meeting our next speaker, Michael Higgins, who would shortly thereafter invite me to participate in a documentary about Henry Nowen, in which he prevailed upon me to recount how meeting Henry informed my faith and sustained me in my tenacious service on behalf of the global church. You might uh, think that this gathering could not get any more soulfully enriching, illuminating, or captivating, but you would be wrong because we have still to hear from Michael Higgins. Michael Higgins is an author, scholar, Vatican affairs specialist, papal commentator, documentarian, columnist, and former senior academic administrator. He has served as president and vice chancellor of two Canadian Catholic universities, St. Jerome's University and St. Thomas University, and as vice president for mission and Catholic identity at Sacred Heart University here in Connecticut, where he is currently distinguished professor of Catholic thought. He is an ideal keynote for this conference. Among the many books he has edited, co-authored, and authored are Heretic Blood, The Spiritual Geography of Thomas Merton, Genius Born of Anguish, The Life and Legacy of Henry J. M. Nowen, and The Unquiet Monk, Thomas Merton's Questing Faith. Fortunately for all of us, Michael has dedicated much of his life and scholarship to illuminating the lives and spirituality of deeply prayerful guides and soulful teachers. Would you please welcome my friend, Michael Higgins. Thank you, Carrie. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to hear an introduction that bears some approximation to the truth. Um, I, I, I've, I've been introduced on, on numerous occasions, and some to startling effect. I remember one, I was sitting with my wife, and somebody was introducing me. I was giving a lecture on um, uh, Marie-Pierre Ch Joseph Théard de Chardin, and it was the 100th anniversary of Chardin's birth, and after the introduction, my wife and I had no idea who she was speaking about. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't recognize myself anywhere in the content. But I, I remember one occasion when I was being introduced at such length that it was two-thirds the length of my lecture. And it was being given, it was, it was, it was well done, um, it was suitably flattering, but it was by somebody whom I didn't like, uh, who, who, su <laughs> who succeeded me as president, and we never got on. So I don't know whether this was a makeup job or, or, or what, but it so irritated the audience that it took me a long time to get them interested in the actual content of, of the lecture. So this was brief and to the point and warm, just like Carrie herself. So it's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's always <laughs> a bit of a dubious pleasure to be the last speaker. Uh, most especially on an occasion like this, where all the speakers who have gone before me have been of an excellent caliber. So um, you've, you've, uh, the, the good news in that is that they have set the, the, the groundwork and the foundations and provided you with ample narrative and given you personal insights, uh, particularly um, when you consider some of them actually knew the principles themselves. The bad news is um, it's difficult to compete with that, though competition is something you should never use in the now in orbit, of course. <laughs> but the difficulty is uh, this is the time of the day 
uh, it's the graveyard shift for most lecturers, right? I mean, you're, you're coping with ever dimming consciousness and um, you're, you're experiencing anguish for food and everything else and here's Higgins standing in the way of what could be a pleasant afternoon. So I, I, realize, I realize I got this force working against me, so I'll, I'll, I'll move to keep, the, keep this within the four hour length. <laughs> Just a few things about, uh, in, in advance, and one is that um, you, uh, you may have noticed the sweet symmetry of the planners. You open with a Canadian and you end with a Canadian. Okay. Now, we're not particularly proprietorial, as you know. <laughs> we're not an imperial power. We have no ambitions for anything, really. Just to, just, just to carry on, just to carry on, hoping that, the, that there is not going to be a northern wall. So we, we, we just kind of negotiate this. So here we are in the unusual position of being uncustomarily showcased by being at the beginning and at, and at the end. And of course, the, um, many of them, like Sue and Karen, who have been drivers of this, of this project, are also from the, um, the nation north of you. Um, there is, again, some value in that. Um, Jim alluded earlier to the fact that these are two Europeans who made an important contribution to North American Catholicism and indeed to Christianity worldwide. And that, that is right. I mean, Nouwen is from Nykirk and um, Merton is from Prade in the French Pyrenees. They were extraterritorial figures. Their spirituality and their thinking was not to be contained within the boundaries. And in some respects, they were unhoused in their language. Nouwen's language of writing was English. His language of birth, of course, was Dutch, and his second language most likely would have been German. And similarly with Merton, Merton was born in France. He was fluent in French, by the way, and he took particular delight when he was at the Lycée Ingres in Montauban, which was the secondary school, the Lycée, and um, every afternoon or every recess, he was beaten up. And he was beaten up because he was English, and he was beaten up because he was uh, Protestant. Okay, so the, these weren't the glory days of Catholic France, but anyway, um, every day he would be beaten up. And a couple of years ago, in a course we were doing in France called Merton in France, I uh, had the chance to examine even more closely his grade sheets, because uh, he won awards, and the highest awards he won for the school upon graduation was in French and in religion. Okay, this was his vengeance, I think. <laughs> being beaten up for being English and Protestant, so he's going to show them he'll you know, get the chief awards in French and in religion. So they were, they were extraterritorial figures in, in many ways, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're drawn to them. We're drawn to them because they speak to our own being unhoused, not necessarily in language, but perhaps in culture, and perhaps in the the whole malaise that seems to affect so many of the jurisdictions of the world as we, st as we struggle to make sense of an increasingly uh, and dangerously darkening landscape. So we, we have these two luminous figures who manage to speak across the borders, across the boundaries. And I think that's an important feature to keep in mind in, as, we, as we wrap up our uh, really stellar uh, mini-conference on these extraordinary architects of our collective spiritual wisdom. I'd like as an epigraph just to quote a very interesting uh, passage in an interview that was published recently in Commonweal magazine concerning the American novelist uh, Mary Lynn Robinson. And she comments that, that the aesthetic should be an aspect of human nature that reveals our affinity to God simply follows from everything. And there is no reason to think it might not be by our lights a difficult or obscure or even a terrible beauty. Now we're gonna look at this terrible beauty. We're gonna look at the aesthetic of Thomas Merton and uh, Henry Nouwen over the next um, uh, period that I have with you, as I want, to, I want to look at how they see things, how they saw things. The notion of pure seeing, um, so, so critical to the phenomenologists, and fresh seeing, so critical to the artists, 
a wonderful phrase that was crafted by the uh, celebrated novelist, but even more celebrated artist, Emily Carr. Um, she spoke about fresh seeing. An artist sees things through a different lens. So I'm going to talk about pure seeing or fresh seeing in the context of a working aesthetic between two, these two men. Oh, now, this is not, not an exercise in, in philosophy, so you needn't worry that it's going to be obscure, opaque, or uninteresting. It may be the latter, but it's not going to be the former. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to concentrate on the concrete, and I'm going to give you examples, as we have had ample and wonderful evidence today with our speakers who have allowed the voices of Merton and Nouwen to be heard. And so I'm going to quote particular passages from their writings to underscore or highlight the way they saw things differently. They're disruptors. And the question you first have to ask yourself is, well, I did, is why would I even use a word like disruptor? Why not innovator or crusader or change or estab establishment gadfly? I mean, any of those could be used. But they realized that disruption is the best word, really, because they shattered in order to make anew. They usurped some standard things in order to go deeper into their origin, because in the end, for all their radical insight, they were not all that surprisingly organic conservatives. Neither was an epistemologist by training or inclination, although Merton rem remained a Thomist all his life. This is a very interesting point, by the way. Thomas Aquinas was critical to um, Merton's understanding of Catholicism. And he remained a card-carrying Thomist right up to the end of his, of his days. In a marvelous uh, essay that was published in the Swanee Review that uh, looked at Thomas Altizer's book, Blake and the New Apocalypse, Merton responded to the then fashionable interest in process theology by affirming the ontology of being, the stability of being, and he said, being, with a capital B, Dachstein, is never static. It is dynamic in the best Thomistic sense. And so at the beginning, just prior to his conversion, and at the end of his life, he remained a committed Thomist. He, he could and did think philosophically. And sometimes this was mediated through his thinking on art, his aesthetics. It's not insignificant, again, to notice that when he wrote his master's thesis on William Blake, he came at him by way of Chakravarti, uh, uh, um, no, not Chakravarti, Kurmaswamy, by way of Kurmaswamy and by way of Aquinas. No approach to Blake has ever been that way. It was absolutely inventive, utterly unique, all right, to bring in the East and to bring in Aquinas, particularly um, uh, through, Mer uh, through Maritain's work, Jacques Maritain's work, Art and Scholasticism, but also through Gilson's work on the spirit of, 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 of uh, Christian philosophy. It's important to say this because he was not a dilettante. Okay? Merton took philosophical reflection seriously. And though he was not by technical training a philosopher, and he would never have uh, ascribed to himself the definition of a metaphysician or a philosopher, he kept company with philosophers, and perhaps most tellingly with the most famous Thomist of his day, Jacques Maritain and his wife Raisa. So questions of art, questions of perception, questions of being matter to Merton. And often we don't think of it that way, do we? I mean, we think of him as a social uh, critic. We think of him occasionally as a literary critic. We think of him as a contemplative. We think of him as a, a robust figure, as Ron would indicate, there on the landscape, on the horizon, never far from our collective consciousness. But he was also had a philosophical disposition that allowed him to look at the essence of things. And you find a good deal of this in his reflections on art. Nowen did more than simply dabble in phenomenological psychology at Nijmegen University in, in, in the Netherlands. He took it very seriously. Uh, phenomenological psychology would be critical to how he perceives things. So I, I, I want to set the ground here. With Merton, it's Thomas Aquinas. With Nowen, it's Husserl and phenomenological psychology. In other words, they have serious foundations upon which they're going to erect their working and pragmatic aesthetic how they see and perceive art. 
And we're going to see why that in the end, that's not just simply an exercise in aesthetics or in art criticism, it's spirituality. Their approach to spirituality is often mediated by art, and it was grounded in aesthetic terms. Let's start with Merton. Merton was both a poet, he was a major religious poet, working in the visionary tradition of such figures as Christopher Smart, William Blake especially, William Butler Yeats, Edwin Muir from Scotland, and very importantly, David Jones from Wales. He was also a visual artist. He was a minor one, but he was a visual artist, working with his calligraphies, of which we've had some talk already, and his photography. I want to contrast him just uh, for a brief second with, uh, with David Jones, because I think it's very illuminating. And some of you may be aware of Jones's work, and, and if you are, then you'll see the analogy, and if not, perhaps you, you would like to become so. Uh, Jones was a, was a poet and a visual artist who Merton discovered quite late in his life, but brought to it the same kind of enthusiasm, the same kind of energy, the same kind of absorbing um, uh, passion that you find with Henry Nouwen. You, you look at the sabbatical journey, Henry Nouwen goes to his first performance of Bizet's Carmen. Okay? It's like it's the first time it's ever been performed in history. Okay, the Bizet's Carmen is the most performed opera in, in operatic history, but now and discovers it for the first time. And the absolutely electric uh, phrasing and excitement in the journal as he comes back talking about Carmen, right? The same thing is if you look at the journals with Merton. Merton hears from his friend, Canon Alchin, about Henry Vaughan. He knew something about Vaughan, of course, because he was a metaphysical, but. David, oh, I've never heard of David Jones before. And all of a sudden, David Jones is the biggest thing since the Trinity. And uh, where has David Jones been in my life? Okay, so David Jones is now the figure of not even the month, but of the next 24 hours, because Merton's passions will move quickly to the next subject upon which it will alight. But the, the, the thing was, Jones touched his soul. If Jones and Merton were companion souls, each an Amkara to the other, as John O'Donohue would say. If they were epic thinkers, Blakeian visionaries, and Catholic converts, and they both were, they were writers who were nurtured by the wellsprings of silence and contemplation. They were also visual artists. We've got David Jones here and Merton there. For instance, the later art of David Jones finds unique expression in something called his inscriptions, which is a very um, clever uh, calibration, visual calibration of uh, Latin and Gothic lettering, forming a, um, an art piece in itself. It's not just a print. He described these word plays as samplers that offer benediction. Samplers that offer benediction. He would send them out as Christmas cards or a, a birthday card. You would get an inscription. Now, of course, they're, they're priceless. People are running around saying, my God, I got a David Jones inscription. I just thought it was a Christmas card because he would write on the back of these and he would send them out. He spoke of them, Jones that is, as my form of abstraction. As Ariane Banks and Paul Hills note in their superb work, The Art of David Jones, Vision and Memory, the following. And some, unlike some of their later figurative drawings that are overburdened with elusive details, and unlike his fragments of an attempted writing as he described in the Anathemata on the title page, the best are highly compressed works resolved and complete." End of quote. Highly compressed works resolved and complete. These are the inscriptions of David Jones. Now watch how it applies to Merton. Merton would write of his Rorschach-like illustrations or abstract markings or calligraphies, which accompanied his prose collection, Raids on the Unspeakable. He said the following. There's no need to categorize these marks. It is better if they remain unidentified vestiges, signatures of someone who is not around. If these drawings are able to persist in a certain autonomy and fidelity, they may continue to awaken possibilities consonances, they may simply help to alter one's perceptions." End of quote. Contrast this with the observation that Jones's inscriptions prompt the viewer to return, to move back and forward, to ponder anew. Merton saw his drawings, or signs, transcending all logical interpretation, their very raison d'etre as summonses to awareness. Both Jones and Merton saw their visual art as 
portals of new seeing. This is why I'm, I'm doing this background for you. There are ways of seeing things differently. And this was as true for the inscription as for the signature, for the painted canvas as for the photographic image. In the words of his poem, The Tutelar of the Place, Jones's work, visual and literary, succeeded in, and I quote, gathering all things in, twinning each brew stem to the swaying trellis of the dance, the dance about the sawn lotus stake on the hill where the hidden stillness is at the core of the struggle. It's an allusion to Calvary. And the hidden wholeness to be found in the visual art of Thomas Merton is a reminder that, and we've already had the quotation earlier from uh, Robert Ellsberg, all matter, all life is charged with dharmakaya, the essence of all beings, and that everything is emptiness and everything, everything is compassion. So the visual art is a portal, a means, an aperture by which we enter into a new seeing, a fresh seeing of the transcendent. It's not, um, they're not dilettantes. It's not something that will pass easily. It's not something that they alight on to move to something else. There's nothing faddish about it. In fact, it's countercultural but it is, a, it is a way of revolutionizing how we perceive. For Merton, Blake's notion of perception is critical to understand what he does as a writer and as a thinker. For, for now and again, it's going to be the artists, people like Vincent van Gogh, Vincent van Gogh, who will have a special role in opening his eyes to the power of art to communicate. And we'll come across these passages shortly. But irrespective of the art proper, what they have in common is their approach to art, to perception and to creation, to pure or fresh seeing. Let me quote a passage for you now, taken um, uh, from that period of time in which Merton began to work on his masterful prose poem, Hagia Sophia, or Holy Wisdom. It's all related to his close friend, Victor Hammer. A typographer, bookbinder, and calligrapher, in addition to his teaching duties in lettering, drawing, and painting, Hammer was the consummate artist and craftsman. On one occasion, when Merton was visiting Victor and his wife, Carolyn, Hammer showed his guest a triptych he had been working on. The central panel of the triptych showed a woman crowning a young boy, and Merton asked aloud who the woman was. Hammer had initially conceived of the woman and the young boy as a Madonna and child, but no longer knew who she was. Merton then responded, Oh, I know who she is. I have always known her. She is Hagia Sophia, Holy Wisdom. In a letter dated May the 2nd of 1959, Hammer invited Merton to come and bless the triptych and explain in greater detail what he meant. This latter request Merton met in a twofold manner, in a letter dated May the 14th of the same year, and in the prose poem of the same name. The poem is an eloquent meditation on and celebration of wisdom. Merton writes, there is in all things an inexhaustible sweetness and purity, a silence that is a fount of action and of joy. It rises up in wordless gentleness and flows out to me from the unseen roots of all created being, welcoming me tenderly, saluting me with indescribable humility. This is at once my own being, my own nature, and the gift of my creator's thought and art within me, speaking as my sister, speaking as my sister, holy wisdom. End of quote. It is then the dawn, the moment of pristine innocence, the moment of prelapsarian joy, the sweet point or point vierge that one may happen on holy wisdom. In Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, in a passage about the first chirps of the waking day birds, Merton writes the following. It's quite a beautiful passage. The birds speak to him, not with a fluent song, but with an awakening question that is their dawn state. 
their state at the Provierge. All wisdom seeks to collect and manifest itself at that blind sweet point. Man's wisdom does not succeed, for we are all fallen into self-mastery and cannot ask permission of anyone. We face our mornings as men and women of undaunted purpose. For the birds, there is not a time that they tell, but the virgin point between darkness and light, between non-being and being. And here is an unspeakable secret. Paradise is all around us, and we do not understand. It is wide open, the sword is taken away, but we do not know it. Wisdom cries the dawn deacon, which is the bird, but we do not attend. Now, this passage, which comes from Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, building on or working with the poem, Holy Wisdom, is basically about perception. It's about how one sees. How does one see the transcendent? Does that even make sense? How does one bracket this? What categories of, on modes of reasoning do we have that allows us any form of approximation to the ineffable? How do we know something like wisdom that lacks tangibility, but the impact on us is no less visceral. Why? Because it's mediated not in concept, not in system, and not in rational discourse, but by art, by the immediacy of art. By looking at the triptych, Merton creates the poem. It's not the other way around. Okay? The triptych created for him through impression and through the process of seeing the triptych in the way that he did, he conceived a whole notion of wisdom, a theology of wisdom, okay, built upon perception. And like Blake, his master, he knows that it is through perception that one sees the cleansing of perception, the cleansing of the senses that one sees most clearly. Okay? It's part of the inheritance of Descartes, that we don't see so clearly. And although Merton is a little unfair to Descartes and even as unfair to some of the Enlightenment figures, he nonetheless gets the point that Blake makes, that, uh, that in fact they are at war with the primary faculty, the faculty closest to the religious instinct, which is not the racial senative faculty, but the imagination. There's that lovely passage about Mozart when Bart dies. You remember when he's talking about Bart, uh, when Bart, Bart actually dies the same day as Merton, but Bart, he has a meditation on Bart and, and Bart's understanding of Mozart. And he says, again, in the conjectures of a guilty bystander, he says to Bart, it will be the Mozart in us that will save us. In all the things that we write, in all the lectures that we give, in all the influence that can or cannot be quantitatively assessed or measured, it will be the Mozart in us that will save us. Well, this is imagination. And in the thinking of William Blake, spiritual imagination has another name. The name is Jesus. So when you, when you look at Merton and Nouwen, how they perceive art, they are in the process of a dialectic, of a dialogue with divinity. It's not looking at the picture as if somehow it's, well, it's there in the art gallery, it's there in a, on, on a showing at a retrospective or something, and we walk by it. It's a conversation. It's an in-depth attention to the terrible beauty that is revealed in the art. What else could keep now and transfixed for hours upon hours upon hours to the despair of his Russian guards at the Hermitage? Okay. The same kind of thing that would happen years later to Sue Mosteller, when they were at a, at a, uh, out at an art gallery, I think it was the AGO, and, and they're sitting there, and Sue tells the story. We're sitting there, and, we, and eventually she turns to Henry and says, what, what are we doing? Okay, what are we doing here? Everybody else is walking by. We're just sitting here, transfixed by this. And he understood it's speaking to us. It's in conversation with us. Right? There is a whole modality of perception here rich, vibrant, and engaged. Uh, Merton, at one point, corresponded with Louis Messignon, who was the distinguished Islamicist. And it was from him that he first heard that term that I had mentioned a couple of minutes ago, point vierge, a virgin point, which means the center of the soul, 
where despair corners the heart of the outsider. It is not only the sweet point, but the enlightened awareness at the juncture of despair. Wisdom represents the voice of creation and the voice of unity, the summons to being, and indeed the sound to judgment. The speaker of the poem uh, is, tells us at the beginning that he is in a hospital lying asleep, and that it is the 2nd of July, the Feast of the Visitation, a feast of wisdom. Sophia comes to the speaker of the poem in his sleep as philosophy came to Boethius, as Beatrice came to Dante, as Gabriel came to Mary, a consolation and a dream, a vision and a longing. In a diary entry of the same day in 1960, Merton wrote of dreaming a very quiet hospital when he was awakened by the soft voice of a nurse. He asks, who is more little than the helpless man asleep in bed, having entrusted himself gladly to sleep and to night? Him the gentle voice will awake, all that is sweet in woman will awaken him, not for conquest and pleasure, but for the far deeper wisdom of love and of joy and of communion. In the tradition of the early church fathers and the Neoplatonists, Merton writes of wisdom not as a particular quality, but as a unique manifestation of the triune God. This unique manifestation of the triune God is found in a triptych. Okay? This is, this is not Merton sitting down and taking various particularly abstruse concepts from the, from the early church fathers, exercising some academic um, departure along the lines of patristical thinking. It is rather Merton responding to a poem. Its generative power is extraordinary. Okay? What happened in that conversation with the triptych? What happened with Nouwen's conversation with Rembrandt's painting that would result in works of such creative fecundity and power? Wisdom assists in the repair of creation itself. Merton would write, and I'll conclude this section here, that the Point Vierge is a point of pure truth, a point or spark which belongs entirely to God. And I'm going to come back to the idea of the point again, not because I'm a literalist, but because it provides a wonderful metaphor in relation to a painting by a, a pointillist artist which is inaccessible to the fantasies of our own mind or the brutalities of our own will. This little point of nothingness and of absolute poverty is the pure glory of God in us. It is to speak his name written in us. It is like a pure diamond blazing with the invisible light of heaven. It is in everybody, and if we could see it, we would see these billions of points of light coming together in the, in the face and blaze of a sun that would make all the darkness and cruelty of life vanish completely. Oh, I have no program for this seeing. I have no program for this seeing. There's not a book you can buy. There's not a guide. There's not a handbook or N. Caridian or something you can pick up and say this is going to happen. Why? Because this seeing, like grace, is only given. But the gate of heaven is everywhere. There's paradise around us, and we don't see it. And we don't see it because we're blinded. Our vision is bracketed and it has become univocal. In Blake's language, it's a certain kind of thinking he calls Eurizen, a univocal, ordered, particular kind of reasoning. But there are other kinds of reasoning, other modes of vision that are critical in order to bring us to integrity and fullness. For now and now, pure and fresh seeing was important as it was for Merton. But its articulation, its modality, was more typical of the art critic, refined, sensitive, and insightful, than the executor of art itself. In a letter to James Luther Adams, a Harvard faculty friend and Unitarian theologian, he identified the special, if not salvific, quality that he found in the art itself. And here is the passage. Art, he's writing to his friends, Art is helping me. The works of Rublev, which we saw earlier about an hour ago, of Rembrandt and Van Gogh, have often given me ways to communicate the mystery of God's presence among us when words prove so inadequate. A few weeks ago, I was in the Louvre and saw Rembrandt's Pilgrim of Emmaus. 
I stood there for half an hour and was so overwhelmed by the ecstatic as well as intimate look of Jesus and the splendid light on his hands breaking the bread that I felt as if I was present at the celebration of the Eucharist itself. The many tourists and talkative guides had vanished from my consciousness. And here's the kicker. I truly was in church. Okay. I truly was in church. He's looking at this painting, and he's there in Emmaus. Okay. This whole experience that he has right now is a profound experience of Eucharist. He's actually in the church. This is Ecclesia right here in the art gallery. It's a very powerful passage. It's not cheaply written. It's a deep reflection upon the power of art and how it affected him. We know of, lo of Nguyen's love of icons, and we know even more about it now thanks to, to Jim. He wrote about them after all. And we know of his admiration for the Dutch masters, for Rembrandt and Van Gogh, both of whom figured largely in his writings and in his spirituality. Evan of Van Gogh, or Van Gogh in particular, he would write to friends Walt and Jet Gaffney on July the, 18th, uh, July, July the 8th, rather, 1979. Here's what he says. This is very powerful, and it's illustrative of the relationship he had with Vincent Van Gogh. And I use that word decidedly, relationship. Vincent Van Gogh wrote to his brother Theo that art is the essence of life and that giving birth to a child is the highest form of art. His letters to Theo are an incredible source of spiritual insights for me and his paintings and drawings are the form of art that most directly speaks to me. I took all my Van Gogh books and Van Gogh slides with me to the monastery and the regular life allows me to read of it while I am there. Van Gogh also helps me think about new ways of communicating. And notice again, it comes back to this. Van Gogh also helps me to think about new ways of communicating. How do I do this? How do I exercise my universal pastorship? How do I do the work that I understand to be my calling? Right? What resources are adequate to this task? How am I to draw from the fruit and from the wisdom of the artists a new way, a new mode, a new perception that allows me to communicate? One of the reasons is he entered the pain of Vincent van Gogh. Okay. Ron talked about this last night, talking about his anguish and pain. Very important to understand this co-sympathy as the Thomas would have it. And he learned this in great measure from his work in Nijmegen. Now, he, 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 his temperament is such that he didn't acquire it in a graduate class in Nijmegen. Now and is now, who now and is. But his work in Nijmegen provided him with a framework of beginning to conceptualize how he could do things that is going to be different. Here is a, a passage about this from Peter Naus, which I think is a, a, a quite a good passage. Peter Naus is a, a former member of the board of the Henry Nouwen Society, a retired uh, psychologist and chancellor emeritus at St. Jerome's University. And importantly for our purposes, he was a fellow student with um, uh, Nouwen at Nijmegen. And he talks about the influence that Husserl and phenomenological psychology had on the two of them when they were doing their work. He says the following, Oh, Henry understood the motto of phenomenology, go back to the thing itself. As a summons to retrieve, to relive the original experience, his writing betrays his phenomenological bias as he tries to get into the experience of anxiety, the experience of being in a competitive relationship, etc. He thinks and feels as a phenomenologist and not as a behaviorist. As a clinical psychologist, Nowen was trained to get into the experience of the patient to the degree that he was successful in mapping out that experience from the inside. He was able to allow his readers to discover and to recognize themselves. That's the genius of it, you see. As he enters into the pain and the power of the individual, 
he begins to allow them to see perhaps most clearly from a distance the nature of their anguish and its possible consolation. Because we don't live only in the world of desolation. So again, it's a, it's, a, it's a conversation, it's a dialectic that goes on between the subject and the, uh, the object, between two interlocutors, between the receiver and the speaker. And one of the defining features of that, of course, is attention, to attend to the other, to attend to the other's pain, to attend to the other's querying, the other's searching, the other's dismay, whatever it is. And he was particularly good at the negative emotions. Okay. He could be there for people in their deepest grief, precisely because he had a way of entering into that grief. And it, because, he, because he entered into that grief, he could give them those, the consolation or the words or the discernment that they needed because it was never the objective clini clinician's evaluation from the outside. And he will owe this, by the way, in no smart, small part to his work on Anton Boysen, a critical figure in the, in the making of the psychological insights of Henry Nouwen. Now, I just want to uh, give you, again, a couple of examples that provide us with a, uh, I think, a very rich illustration of how he approaches art. And then I'm going to draw some conclusions from it. You can see this phenomenological approach in his neat dissection of the art of Edward Hopper, whom he contrasts with Vincent van Gogh and with another American uh, painter, like Edward Hopper, but very unlike Edward Hopper, Georgia O'Keeffe. And here are his reflections in sabbatical journal. Again, as you read the journal, sometimes, you know, when we read diaries and we read journals, we sometimes skip over or we see a particular passage or we don't, we don't think it's been reasoned through uh, with a particular kind of cogency, but it's nicely crafted or it's, it's impressionistic or it's experiential or whatever. And sometimes when we do that, we miss the fact that often diaries and journals may contain the kernel the core of a special wisdom. And that's why I think the diaries of Henry now are amongst his most important work, because he's not only probing in the diaries, this is my reflection, this is my impression and whatnot, he's beginning to do it through the, the lens of his own self-disclosure. So here's what he says about um, George O'Keefe, first of all. Why is George O'Keefe so popular? I, I think it is the combination of her personality and her art. Just as Vincent, he, it's interesting, he calls Van Gogh Vincent all the time. <laughs> he called one of his closest friends, Robert Jonas, Jonas, he always called him by his last name. So I, 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 don't, I don't know whether he thought it was Van Gogh Vincent or, or Jonas Robert or whatever, but he, he had a way of identifying sometimes, which might suggest a kind of certain learning disorder, or it was just his eccentric way of entering into that relationship. Robert Jonas told me at one time, he said, I gave up to telling him, I'm Robert, by the way. <laughs> Jonas is my last name. Okay, I just go, with, I'll just go with Jonas. I mean, this is a sign of affection anyway. So he ran, <laughs> it ran with Jonas. So he, and he, Vincent van Gogh is Vincent. There's no other Vincent. No Vincent de Paul. Okay. <laughs> Vincent Parra. No, 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 it's just Vincent van Gogh. So he says, just as Vincent's story and his art cannot be separated, so George's story and her art belong together. It's not just her paintings that hold me in their grip. It's also this most remarkable woman whose intense search for intimacy and solitude is part of the art she created. Seeing her art is seeing her life. And seeing her life is helping me see my own. Okay, let me repeat that because that, that's the mantra. Seeing her art is seeing her life. And seeing her life is helping me see my own. I realize that my emerging questions and my strong feelings about George O'Keefe are closely connected. They both reflect my struggle to reach a new integration of solitude, intimacy, and creativity in the decades ahead of me. Well, he wouldn't have a decade ahead of him. He would have about three months when he wrote this. In a very revealing passage as well, um, contrasting 
the way he responds to Giorgio O'Keeffe is the way he responds to the paintings of another American artist, Edward Hopper. He says, I have always been greatly admiring of the work of the American painter Edward Hopper, but I have equally disliked it. As much as I would desire to have a real Van Gogh in my room, thereby pushing him into the 0.1% of the national demographic, I would fear having a real Hopper. This is really interesting. The light in Hopper's paintings is brilliant, but the light has no warmth. Yeah. Everything in his work, it seems to me, speaks of alienation, separation, and distance. There is no intimacy. There is only immense loneliness. In Edward Hopper, an intimate biography by Gail Levin, it becomes dramatically clear that Hopper lived what he painted. His relationship with his wife, Josephine, was cruel and abusive. Joe's elaborate diaries, which form one of the main sources of this biography, reflect the tragedy of their 40 years of their marriage. It is amazing to see, notwithstanding all the assertions that art should be evaluated independent of the artist's personality, how close the connections are between the artistic work and the life and personality of the artist. This certainly is the case with all the artists I have paid attention to in my life, Rembrandt, Van Gogh, and Chagall. Edward Hopper's chilling life, frightfully reflected in his chilling art, affirms this connection. Vincent Van Gogh's relationships were not any more satisfying than Hopper's, but there is a huge difference between the two. Vincent's fervent desire to be close to somebody, his dream of forming a colony of artists, and most important of all, his affectionate, although turbulent, love for his brother, is visible in all his works. In contrast to that of Hopper, Vincent's light is not only brilliant, but full of warmth. All the people he paints are radiant like suns, like saints, and his orchids, cypresses, and wheat fields are burning with the fire of his intense feelings. His many, and I love this line, his many hot yellows are radically different from the cold yellows of Edward Hopper. Here's the important point of this reflection. The soul of the artist cannot remain hidden. The bitter, isolated, and mean soul of Hopper and the restless but love-hungry soul of Van Gogh are both revealed in their works. Vincent van Gogh was and remained a minister, always trying to bring people together even though he failed miserably. Edward Hopper was and remained a man who was only interested in himself, and he lived and he died in splendid isolation. Now, that's not just an artistic reflection. It is that. It's a spiritual reflection. Vincent van Gogh is Henry Nouwen. The alternative would have been Edward Hopper. That's an alternative he would never consider. Okay. So the, the artwork, the canvas itself, is what Boysen would call a living human document. This is where the lines blur most productively in Nouwen's thinking. Okay. You may remember, those of you who have read some of Henry's earlier work, intimacy and some of the early work in the 1970s, uh, Wounded Healer is another perfect example, his indebtedness to the work of Anton Boysen, who, who died in the mid-1960s. Boysen was variously a forester, um, a, a minister, um, a Presbyterian minister, but he was also the founder of critical care uh, um, for a chaplain's care in mental health institutions particularly. That was his special gift and now and fun fell hugely under his sway and even made a point of going to see him shortly before he died. He spent a uh, not insignificant part of his life in mental institutions uh, when he was not teaching, uh, when he was not doing his other work. He was in mental institutions and, and he wrote an autobiography called Out of the Depths, De Profundus. And he went out there now and, and saw him shortly before he died. Okay. Boysen had a considerable influence on him. And one of Boysen's arguments is that when you're dealing as a social worker or as a psychologist or as a clinician, whatever, in the helping professions, you're dealing not with case studies. You are dealing with living human documents. 
This was Boysen's insight. Nowen was profoundly uh, affected by that. But it begins to translate, or indeed transmute, into his own art. So that the art he looks at is like a living human document. It's not just a statement. It's not just a cold, calculated piece of technical wizardry or mastery. It's a portal. It's an entry point into wisdom and into depth and to the divine. For now and art and biography, therefore, are inextricably linked. The canvas is similar to Boysen's living human documents. They tell the narrative of a life. And what Nowen wants to do is he wants to fall into their story. Okay? He wants to fall into the story. The prodigal son, the return of the prodigal son, is a marvelous example of that falling into the story. You have Luke's parable. You have Rembrandt's arresting portraiture of that moment. And you have Nowen falling into the story. That's what he needs to do. I want to give you an example of this. There, um, there's a wonderful uh, recent uh, review, actually, again in, in Commonwealth, called Hallow uh, Hallowing the Gaps, Not Letting Certainty Smother Faith. And it's a reflection on a Seurat painting. And just, just listen briefly to what to sit here, and then I'll show you how it connects to now and, and then Merton. Imagine a Seurat painting. A hundred thousand pointless dots layered thickly and with utmost care on a vast canvas. Hang the piece on a massive wall, and each tiny splotch of paint will cohere into a larger image, into a unified whole. But shrink the room in your mind's eye till it becomes no more than a narrow hallway, and you'll never have the distance for a good view. What can you see this close? Nothing but individual dots, resolutely independent. You can press your back against the wall and crane your neck, fighting the room for a vantage point that will let the points blend into something recognizable. But you won't find it. No individual dot tells an honest story. Stand a nose length away from the canvas, smell the trace of turpentine, then pick a dot. A smudge of pink, say, suggestive of skin or coral or sunlight skimming the lake. Or stare at the tar blue knife, Nick, whose sheer edge makes you flinch. By itself, what can this one dot possibly disclose about in the larger purposes? So it isn't just the one dot. It's all the dots. But you only see the, all the dots through the one dot. The focused attention and lens allows you to configure the larger la landscape. By looking at the story of Rembrandt, what Rembrandt tells of the prodigal son, you see the story of the father. You see the story of the elder brother. You see the story of Rembrandt and his relationship with his children, most of whom are dead. You Rembrandt, whose own aching spirituality is displayed with power on that canvas. But that's not where the narrative ends, because that narrative is picked up by Nowen himself. So you're going to have the narrative of who Nowen is. The painting isn't a dead thing. It's a living human document. It's a portal. It's a way of seeing. It's a pure way of seeing. You know, we, we've mentioned over the last uh, 24 hours on a couple of occasions the notion of attention. Attention has special meaning in the thinking of Simon Weil. And attention is an exercise not, in, not simply realized in silence. It is a mode or form of divin divinization. When we attend, we attend on the divine. We attend in silence on the ineffable. And so when we come to art, we enter into that same sacred silence, which is a form of communication. For Merton and for Nowen, both of whom were sacred disruptors, who entered the landscape of a canvas, such art, as I say, is an aperture to holiness. It's a window into the eternal geography. Their senses are cleansed, their perception liberated, 
Allah William Blake. And I would argue now, because I've just discovered him over the last 13 months, John Moriarty, an Irish um, epic visionary, a late contemporary whose own notion of silver branch perception was in consonance with theirs. Moriarty would